But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Father, you know my heart, and you know how weak I am, and how I'm so prone to wander. But God, I pray that this is, may this be a reminder to me of how you've been so faithful. God, that has allowed me to stand here today. Help me, Lord, that God, that I will be faithful to the very end. God, I'm here to testify about your goodness, and Lord, my need for you in my life. Help me today and always to put on the attitude of Christ, to have a passion for Christ, to make Him known wherever I go and whatever I say. I pray that as we study Your Word, that You will restore hearts back again, that when we fail, that You meet us where we're at. Equip us today with Your Word, so that we may be filled with the fullness of God. So we pray this all in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, as you guys know, uh, today is the launch and the beginning of small groups. And so it's very exciting to see all these people who have signed up and are, are ready to get uh, in touch with one another. And as uh, people are doing life together, uh, rubbing elbows with the person next to them, um, we know that this is going to be an exciting time uh, for everyone. Now, and I know that for me personally, I've always enjoyed small groups because I learned a lot uh, from other people. And not only did I learn about other people and how to work with them and finding out different personalities, but I, I've also learned more about myself. And I've really matured um, over the years through small group members. And so uh, I know that you guys will enjoy this semester. And I, and I thank, that, thank the Lord that this ministry has really grown so much. And the reason why I bring up the importance of doing life in the context of community uh, is because that's how God created us to be. God created us to be in community. Um, as we see God the Father, Jesus the, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity is an image of community. And that's why it's so important for us today. But we also know that as we live in community, it can be very difficult because, let's face it, you know, we live in a world and society that tells us that we need to look out for ourselves, that we are number one. You should only care about yourself and no one else. And if you want to survive in this world, it's not about helping others, but it's about helping yourself. And Paul understood that if you want to break up, if you want to divide a church, the best way to do, th do that is to place your agenda above everyone else's. And when you plant the seed of selfishness, uh, when you become egotistical, when you become self-absorbed, when you become self-centered, uh, anything self-related, you can easily divide the church. And so Paul addresses this issue and that we, in this passage, as we see that the unity of, unity of believers is when we put on the attitude of Christ. And so as you have your Bibles or open up your Bible apps, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. And the title of today's message is, Others Above Self. And this is very important, addressing not only to the people in the church of Philippi, but here at OEM as well. That we need to learn what it means to place others above self. Uh, so we're going to take a look at verses 1 to 2. It says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. 
And so the first thing that we see in these first two verses is that others above self is portrayed through unity. Right? Others above self is portrayed through unity. And Paul spells out the motivation for seeking unity in the church in these four clauses that begin with the word any. Okay? And another way to translate that word any uh, can be as, as surely as. And so these are not some sort of probabilities or, or things like that, but it's more of a certainty or realities that you've gained through Christ. So Paul combines the divine work of God along with human experiences in Christ, and he puts them together to help us to understand what it looks like to have unity in the church. So let's take a closer look at these four clauses. First one being, any encouragement in Christ. And it's encouraging to know that anyone can be saved. You know, regardless of your background, regardless of your history, uh, regardless of what type of family or upbringing you had, any person can be saved. And that's what's so glorious about the Christian walk, of how grace is so available. And we can encourage other people through our testimonies. And so if you've ever had a chance to share with someone what God has been doing in your life, um, hopefully as you share those things, the the listener will be greatly encouraged to know uh, the kind of work that God has done in your life. And who doesn't like to receive encouragement from someone? You know, when someone comes up to me and gives me a bag that's filled with cans of Spam and tells me that they're thinking about me as they're giving me this gift, you know, I feel so encouraged. You know, the other week someone did that, and I, I don't know if they're trying to get rid of things in their, uh, in their cabinets or whatnot, but giving it to me, the, telling me that they're thinking of me gives me great encouragement. You know, if you're familiar with the five love languages, uh, which are words of affirmation, acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time, and physical touch. You know, people ask me, which of the five love languages do you like to receive the most? And when people ask me that, and I think, is this a trick question? You know, because honestly, I enjoy all five of these love languages. You know, I say, bring it on. Give me all of them. I'm easily encouraged. Tell me anything. You know, you can pat me on the back, and I'll be greatly encouraged. You can buy me a cup of coffee, I'll be greatly encouraged. You can go wash my car. You can sit down and talk with me and tell me what a a great person that I am, and I'll be greatly encouraged. And Paul is saying here is that if we have any encouragement in Christ, that what we see from Christ needs to flow out of us from one member to the next. And so if we want to see unity in the church, we need to ask ourselves, how can I encourage someone today? And that's something very practical that we can do. You know, before we walk out of the church, what's something or someone that you can encourage today? And I want you to write that down. Think about it. Pray about what God wants you to do. The second clause that we see here is any comfort from love. You see, the kind of comfort that Paul is talking about here comes from being united in the same kind of struggle. And so, if you guys are familiar with Paul, as he writes his letters, he's writing from prison. So you know that the situation that he's in, it's not very easy. And he doesn't know if the next day, if he's going to die. But what brings Paul comfort is knowing that Christ himself suffered. And because Christ suffered and he was vindicated by God, he knows that one day he himself will be vindicated by God as well. And so this is what it means when he says, any comfort from love. And if you take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, I love what Paul writes here. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ 
we share abundantly in comfort too. In these short, in these three verses, we see the word comfort being repeated over and over again. Paul understands and realizes that he has received comfort from God time and time again. That no matter how difficult his situation may be, even though he may not be fed every, every day, even though his prison cell may be small, it may be musky, it may have not any sunlight, even though he may be facing death every single day, he has received comfort from God. And in the same way, if you have received comfort, Paul is saying, don't keep that to yourself, but learn to comfort others who have been going through the same kind of difficulties and struggles that you have gone through. Don't be selfish. Don't keep it to yourself, but learn to share that. Learn to seek out those people who are going, the same, going through the same kind of sufferings so that you can be a comfort to them. And then the third clause that we see here is any participation in the Spirit. And the word for participation here in the Greek is called koinonia. Okay? I had a hard time pronouncing that at Dogo because I had to look it up. Koinonia. Okay? And in the secular world, um, for them, that word was used to describe business partners. And so if some people wanted to go into business together, open up a restaurant or open up a, a certain firm or a clothing store, they would go into business together and this is what it was called. But Paul here is saying that we're not in the participation as business partners, but he's saying that we are now partners in the gospel. As we serve together, as we do life together, as we participate in the Spirit together. In ministry context, as you get to know the other person, as you participate in small groups together, as you get to know others in your group, learn to step out of your comfort zones. Learn to love that person. Learn to care for them. Learn to pray for them. Learn to share stories with them. And when you're in that group, if someone is hurting, you should be hurting as well. If, they, if your group represents a body, a body of Christ, everyone should be involved. And so pray that you'll be sensitive in the Spirit. So if you notice that a member may be struggling with something, maybe you notice a member may be having a difficult day, learn to bear the burdens with them. When they hurt, you should hurt. So we need to stop creating these walls to protect ourselves, but we need to make ourselves available and vulnerable to one another. And then the fourth clause we see here is any affection and sympathy. And Paul used this term in the letter uh, earlier in chapter 1, verse 8, when he expressed how he longed for his friends with the affection of Christ Jesus. He calls on them to remember how their lives have been touched by the tenderness of Christ so that they will tenderly care for the interests of other people. You see, sympathy was used to display concern over another's misfortune. You know, sadly today, the entertainment industry is making millions at laughing at other people, other people's misfortunes, other people's injuries, other people getting hurt. And we're all guilty of that, aren't we? When we see practical jokes, when we see people getting injured, when we see people fighting inside a cage, you know, we, we, long, we, we get excited. We enjoy seeing that happening. But Paul is saying that we need to have affection and sympathy for one another. We need to learn to care for the interests of others and not just for ourselves. And then we see in verse 2 it says, Complete my joy. And he writes three phrases to explain how we can complete his joy. He says, by having the same mind. So he's calling his friends to seek the same goal with a like mind. You know, he's not saying that we all need to have the same kind of personality. He's not saying that we all need to, to like the same kinds of food. We, we, it's not about having the same kind of, we love the same kind of colors. 
But he's saying that we all have the same goal, the same vision, the same mission of what we want to accomplish. And I love that about OEM. That all of you here, you understand the mission of this church is to get you on mission with God. And I love how people are, are going, taking that step of faith, going to different countries, going to areas, going to places that have never heard the gospel. And that is what this church is all about. Getting you on mission with God. And that is what it means to have the same kind of mind. But he also says, having the same love. Love begins when someone else's needs are more important than yours. Love begins when someone else's needs are more important than your own. And that's what we need to understand. That we don't learn to love until you place others above yourself. And that requires giving up any kind of selfish ambition. John 13, 34, Jesus says, Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And how did Jesus love us? By dying for us. And just as Jesus died for us, we need to have that same kind of unselfish love for one another. If we can die for that person, I'm sure the little things that may annoy you about that person won't bother you anymore. If we had the mentality, you know what? I can die for this brother. I can die for this sister. I'm sure it will, it will make a world of difference. But then he also says, how you can make this joy complete is by being in full accord and of one mind. So he goes from saying, same mind to one mind. So he's hammering home this challenge to be united by focusing on one common goal. You see, when we have our own personal agendas, they will pull us in different directions, and it's going to split the church. But when we have one mind, it means agreeing to submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It means having the mind of Christ. But then it moves on. As we look at verses 3 to 4, it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So the second thing that we see here is others above self portrayed through humility. Okay? Others above self portrayed through humility. And to be honest, reading these verses was, it was very tough for me to swallow, to understand what it means to look to other people's interests. Because, you know, from the time that we're born, you know, we are by nature, we're very selfish, aren't we? You know, we cry because we want to get fed. Uh, we cry because, you know, our diapers need to be changed. We cry because we, we, we need to be burped. Or we cry because we're tired. And when we're infants, everything revolves around us, isn't it? Your parents will do anything and everything for you. And I think, you know, when I turned 30 years of age, I think that was a, a major turning point in my life. Because that's around the time where I had just gotten married and I just had my first child. And so both my marriage and the birth of my son happened in a span of about 13 months. And so, you know, being a husband and being a father quickly showed me how selfish I can be. Because up until then, 30 years of my life, it was all about myself. But now, now that I was married, now that I was a father, I had to learn to care for someone else. And, you know, as soon as I, after we got married, you know, I started running out of ideas of, for gifts to get, to my, get for my wife. So I, I ran out of all the romantic ideas. I think getting married and having a child just sucked all that out of me, you know. And also I think mentally I started thinking, oh, you know, now the two of us were one. And so, you know, whenever I would try to buy presents for my wife, I would start having this idea and this mentality, you know what? Maybe I'll get my wife an iPad. Or maybe I'll, you know, I'll get my wife a laptop. Or I'll, I'll get her a camera. And the reason why I would want to, to get these things for her is not because I want to bless her, 
It's because I wanted these things, you know? I wanted the iPad. I wanted the laptop. I want the camera. And so by giving it to her, I get to use it, right? And that was my mentality. And I started realizing, oh my goodness, I am so selfish. And, you know, I would try to subtly, you know, bring these things up to her and be like, hey, honey, you know, I noticed, you know, you need some help with, like, computer stuff. And, you know, maybe you need a new laptop. And, quit, you know, she would read me right away like a book. She's like, you want it, don't you? It's because you want it. <laughs> and it's so true. I started realizing how selfish I can be, even towards my wife. However, on the, on the other side of things, I saw how my wife was an example of Christ to me. If you ever met my wife or if you ever spent time with her, she is an amazing woman of God. It's amazing how she serves. It's amazing how she sacrifices herself for the sake of me, the children, even her friends and other people. She puts other people's needs above her own. And it humbles me to see what she goes through every single day. No, because by the time it's time for her to go to sleep, once it's like 9 p.m., she's out like a light. And I'm like, why are you so tired? And then there are days when I have to watch the kids all by myself for an entire day. And I realize, oh my goodness, if any of you had trouble sleeping, come over to my house. I guarantee you it will help knock you out. Because I was so tired, I couldn't believe that this is the kind of schedule that my wife had to, had to go through every single day. I would go crazy. But she does this because she loves us. And that to me was what Christ had done for me. How she sacrifices her time, her energy, and her love for me and for our children. And how is it possible to count others more significant than us? How can we look into the interests of others? The key is found in humility. The source of humility is in the cross. Humility literally means to make oneself lower. That's what it means to be humble. It's to lower yourself in front of others. You let the needs and interests of others surpass yours. You learn to put them in first place. You learn to give them the place of honor. You learn to respect them. You listen to them, you serve them, you strengthen them, you encourage them. That's what it means to place someone else's interests above your own. In other words, these verses are very similar to the words of Jesus when he says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. It means making others the focus of your interests, finding your joy in making others joyful. You know, when I'm at home relaxing and when my daughter comes up to me and says, can you play with me? You know, the first thing that comes to mind are my own interests. It's like, I want to have time for myself. I want to be able to relax. And I'm thinking about myself rather than looking out for the interests of my daughter. And then sometimes when we do go out and play, I find myself doing other things while telling her to go play on the swings. And I realize I, I've been so convicted of this. And you know, as parents, we're guilty of that, aren't we? I, I don't think I'm the only one. You know, and we tell our kids to go out and play, and we look out for our, our own interests, don't we? Can we learn to put the interests of our children? Can we learn to put the interests of others above our own? See, if we want to have a healthy church, then we need to be a people where we consider each other more important than oneself. Selfish ambition can spread like cancer, and it can quickly destroy relationships and the church. You know, an example, I remember growing up, uh, there was uh, this thing called beta and VHS tape recorders. And uh, when they came onto the market, it was like the newest technology. You know, you can actually watch movies um, on, these, on these tapes. And so I remember at first our, our family had purchased a Betamax. And then um, slowly, all of a sudden, everyone started getting VHS tape recorders instead. And I never knew the reason why um, VHS would, became more popular than the Betamax. And then I came across this article 
in Time magazine uh, that provided an insight to this issue. And this is what it says. It says, during the introduction of the video cassette recorder, Sony made a crucial mistake. While at first, Sony kept its beta technology mostly to itself, JVC, the Japanese inventor of the VHS format, shared its secret with other firms. As a result, the market was overwhelmed by the sheer volume of the VHS machines being produced. This drastically undercut Sony's market share. The first year, Sony lost 40% of the market, and by 1987, it controlled only 10%. Because of the company's selfish ambition, it led to its downfall. And I think there's a lesson that we can learn from, from this story. Is that when we become selfish, the only person that we hurt is ourselves. We are called to put others above ourselves. So as a church, let's learn to count others more significant than ourselves. And then it's the third thing that we see here in this passage is having others above self portrayed through the example of Christ. Others above self portrayed through the example of Christ. And I'll read for us verses 5 to 11. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." And so we see here the example of Christ that Paul is, is portraying for us here. In order to put others above ourselves, we need to have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. And so what can we learn through the example of Christ? We see his sacrifice in verse 6. And if you take a look at this thought process in this act of sacrifice, that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. You know, even though he was the Son of God, he had the same nature as the Father. Jesus was equal to the Father. However, Jesus didn't use his equality with God to his advantage. Instead, he sacrificed it. He let go of his divine abilities. This needs to be our thought process as well. Even if we think someone is worse than us, because of our calling to be like Christ, we need to gladly sacrifice it by considering others better than ourselves. You see, Christ was above everyone. He was above everybody. But instead, He lowered Himself and didn't exercise His rights in order that we may be saved. Is that our way of thinking as well? That even though we have rights, even though we have titles, even though we have all these worldly things, are we willing to sacrifice them so that we can paint the picture of Christ to this world? And we also see his, his servant nature in verse 7. That even though Jesus was God, he decided to come to earth as a man. When it says he made himself nothing, it doesn't mean that he, he emptied himself of his divine attributes and became a man. Instead, it means he nullified his divine nature by gaining a human nature. You know, what does that look like? What does that mean? Uh, you know, a way I can picture this or, or paint a picture for you. It's like a person in a wheelchair. That even though he's in a wheelchair, everywhere he goes, you know, he's you know, pushing himself around but he has the ability to stand up and walk. But instead, he chooses to sit and stay put in this wheelchair, even though he has the ability to stand up and walk. He chooses to do that 
because it humbles him and causes him to, to nullify his divine attributes. And that's what he's doing. He was tempted in every way, yet he didn't use his divine nature when he lived on earth. He could have so easily just snapped his finger or pointed the finger or called down thunder upon someone. But instead he chose to keep it to himself. He had to be in human form in order to replace us on the cross. You know, one of my favorite verses on Jesus as a servant comes from Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. It's a ransom for many. And I love that verse. The, the idea that God, that Jesus was God. He was a son of man. And yet he came to this earth to serve people like you and I. You know, if, if he came to this earth, if God came to this earth, we should be the ones that are his servants. We should be the ones doing whatever he wants us to do. But instead, what did he do? He got down on his knees took off the cloth, the towel, and he started wiping the feet of his disciples. And he tells them to do likewise. That was the kind of servant attitude our Savior, our God, had for us. And so we are not to just act like servants, but we need to understand that we are servants. That if we have the mind of Christ, we need to understand what it means to be a servant, because he was a servant of all. And we also see his obedience in verse 8. When Jesus added his human nature, it was permanent. It wasn't just a temporary thing. It wasn't like, oh, I'll be a man for, for a couple of years, and I'll go back to being God, and I'll go back to being, being in heaven, and enjoying all the things that I had. You see, Jesus added the human nature while still remaining to be God. And he will remain that way forever. That was the price that Christ had to pay on our behalf. Jesus had to do this so that he can save us. You see, God the Father, he's still the same. God the Holy Spirit, he's the same. But Jesus, God the Son, he had to add on the human nature. And so one day, when we get to heaven, and when you see Jesus, you will see the scars in his hands. You will see the mark on his foot. You will see the, the pierced side that he had to endure for our sake. That will all still be there even when we get to heaven. Out of obedience, Jesus died as a man because of our lack of obedience. When we fail to love others, we lack obedience. So Jesus had to take our place because of our sinful nature. But the, all, the whole reason why he did this, and we see this, is because he did this for his glory. He did this for the glory of, of his Father, in verse 9 to 11. You see, what happens when there's unity in the body of the church? You see, unity is a visual illustration of the gospel. When you see a church united, that gives an, an image of what the gospel should look like. And it leads to giving God the glory. Our attitude should not be, you know, if I humble myself, then one day God will exalt me. No, our attitude should be, our goal needs to be to humble ourselves because we want to be more like Jesus. Because he was all about giving God the glory. He was so consumed about making sure that his father received all the praise. And that's what we need to do as well. Are we consumed about giving glory to God? Do we understand what Jesus did for us? Because if we understand that, then we'll be working hard to put on the mind and the attitude of Christ Jesus. And if that's your desire, let's turn to the Lord in prayer at this time. Shall we? Let's pray. God, I pray for, for myself and for all of us here that, God, you will strengthen us with your power of your spirits. God, I pray that Christ may dwell in their hearts and that through faith and that they will be rooted and grounded in love. I pray that they will have the strength to comprehend what it means 
to have the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and that they will be filled with the fullness of God. I pray, Lord, that that will be so overflowing, God, that it will be contagious within this church. God, I pray that we will learn to lay down our desires, lay down the things that, that we hold fast to. And God, that we will learn to put ourselves uh, below others. Father, help us to be humble because you were the humble king. You were the one that was the example for all of us to follow. And we ask, God, that we will follow in your steps. God, that we will do it gladly because you, you gave up all. You gave everything, Lord, to, to sacrifice yourself on the cross for us. God, may we be willing to die for the person next to us. May we be willing to die for our brother and for our sister because that's the kind of love that saved us from eternal hell. And we thank you for that. May we show that may be revealed in how we walk and how the culture of this church is presented. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in this church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.